There is an all-party motion on International Women's Day 2024. Can I ask the clerk to read the motion, please? That this Assembly recognises that International Women's Day is a global celebration of the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. Believes that this day both serves as a powerful reminder of the progress made towards gender equality and highlights the work that still needs to be done and supports action to break down barriers, challenge stereotypes and create environments where all women are valued and respected. And can I call on Cara Hunter to move the motion, please? Uh, thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour, 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All, our spe all other speakers will have five minutes. Cara, please open the motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to move this motion put to the floor today with respect to International Women's Day 2024. It is imperative that we not only reflect on the progress that we've made in advancing women's rights, but also acknowledge the challenges that still persist both here at home and across the globe. Today, we reflect and we celebrate not just International Women's Day, but to honour the strength, resilience and achievements of women everywhere. This day holds immense significance as it not only acknowledges the progress that we have made so far, but underscores the journey ahead towards true gender equality in Northern Ireland. In the North, as in many other parts of the world, women have played key pivotal roles in shaping our society, our culture and our history. From leaders in politics to pioneers in the arts, from activists on the front lines to caregivers in our homes, women have continuously broken barriers and defied expectations placed on them so often by society. That's why I welcome the time today to contribute today on this debate. I welcome contributions today that will take place from this House, from diverse women, from diverse backgrounds, with different beliefs and different lived experiences who are here today across this chamber. Diversity makes us who we are. It strengthens our places and our policies, and we must have women at uh, tables where decisions are being made. Mr Deputy Speaker, for generations here, women in our society have carried so much on their shoulders. Transgenerational trauma has been carried on the backs of women for generations here. And I particularly note, during years of the conflict, women, uh, during what was an extremely difficult time, kept on going as mothers, grandmothers, community leaders, entrepreneurs and politicians. In every documentary about the troubles I have watched, there is always quietly a woman in the house keeping things going, out on the streets, fighting for peace as well, despite the horror and violence on our streets during what was an unbelievably difficult and tragic time in our history. As we reflect on strides made, we cannot ignore the challenges that continue today. Inequalities do still exist, barriers still stand, and injustices still prevail. Women continue to face discrimination, harassment, and violence simply because of their gender. Misogynistic attitudes sadly continue to over-sexualise and objectify women, and these realities remind us of the urgent need to continue our collective efforts toward gender equality and early intervention in our education system, in our schools, to tackle these mindsets early and to ensure that women are respected and celebrated within the classroom, the home and wider society. International Women's Day serves as a reminder of the work that remains for us here left to do. It's a call to action for governments, institutions and individuals alike to commit to tangible change. We must strive for equal representation in decision-making positions and processes, equal opportunities in education and employment, and equal access to health care and resources. This House must continue to use our platforms as women to tackle the grave issue of violence against women and girls in Northern Ireland. And I welcome that in the most recent weeks since this place has been back up and running, that we've used that opportunity to talk about tackling violence against women and girls and to touch on the lives of those bright, talented, loved women <coughs> whose lives were so tragically taken. And I think that's really important. Whose lives were taken from their family and their loved ones. And today, when we reflect on celebrating women and what it is to be a woman, I'd like to remember them too, because I know across this house, we certainly won't forget them and their stories. Mr Deputy Speaker, given its proximity to this motion, I would also like to include the point uh, of last week we know uh, funding was cut briefly 
uh, for Nexus uh, NI, and 80% of their victims who have survived a sexual assault or sexual harassment or sexual violence are female. And I'm just mindful, when we talk about celebrating women, we want to ensure we're doing all we can to support uh, women, who are, women and girls who are victims and survivors of sexual violence. So I think it's really uh, important that we all use our platform to ensure that that counselling continues without lapse, is available to all without delay and denial for both victims and survivors. And I'm so happy, and I'm sure other members across this House are, that that funding has resumed, and so that victims of all genders who have survived uh, these traumas will continue to be seen. Women face many challenges in life, but period poverty is often a silent crisis that affects millions of women and girls across the world, including here in the North. And sadly, what we have seen since this uh, Assembly has come back is the cut of up to 40% uh, behind the period poverty bill. And we know no woman and no young girl should suffer the indignity of being unable to access those products. And I would urge that we collectively across this House continue to raise this issue to ensure that we have adequate funding necessary to change lives and maintain dignity as well. Women and girls are forced to choose between buying menstrual products and meeting other basic needs such as food, uh, heating and eating. This should not be the reality in the 21st century. Menstruation is a natural biological process and no woman or girl should feel either ashamed or disadvantaged as a result of it. We must work together to dismantle the stigma around menstruation and ensure that hygiene products are available, accessible and affordable. Uh, to all women and girls, regardless of socio-economic background. As policymakers, we must prioritise health as a fundamental human right and take concrete steps to address period poverty <coughs> once and for all. And I really do welcome, uh, in the initial few weeks, uh, the past few weeks, we have talked at length about women's health. Um, and I think that's a huge pillar of when we talk about the quality of life and celebrating women, what it is to be a woman. Health is such a huge aspect of that. And what we've continued to, to both see and hear in our constituency offices uh, and in this assembly is stories of women going weeks, if not months, uh, struggling to get a diagnosis for things like endometriosis, PCOS, um, and even issues around uh, infertility and issues wider to do with reproductive health. Um, I think we really must make this effort across this house, not just women, but men also, uh, to push that to the forefront uh, of ministers' minds and uh, make sure it's well funded by the executive. Um, and I really appreciate that stories across this house of difficulties with those challenges, with things like uh, miscarriages, baby loss, uh, members here have been so brave in opening up and talking about those issues. It's educating me, it's educating members across this house, um, and it actually, you know, it opens up discussions which were once quite sensitive in society and people would hide and were quite stigmatised but now we're seeing you know this wonderful open discussion and I think it will greatly help women and girls uh, who are listening to us uh, feel comfortable in sharing their stories and on the wider issue of women's health know what signs and symptoms to look for as well so I just really wanted to include that and lastly uh, Mr Deputy Speaker as we celebrate International Women's Day let us recommit ourselves to the fight for gender equality and for justice let's work tirelessly to eradicate violence against women and girls in the north in all its forms to ensure that every woman and girl living here can do so and can live with dignity, freedom and a sense of equality that they so rightfully deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And may I call on Emma Sharon, please. I'm delighted this afternoon uh, to stand in support of this cross-party motion celebrating International Women's Day, the theme of which this year was to inspire inclusion. And when you think of what inspiring inclusion means, it's to involve everyone, it's to include everybody, to ensure that we can all access prosperity, that nobody is excluded from that. No woman or girl left behind, regardless of background, and that means including our rural women, including our women of colour, our LGBT women, our disabled women. Because the glass ceiling isn't really broken if it is just cracked for some. This weekend was an opportunity to celebrate, not just ourselves and our mothers or sisters or friends, but to acknowledge the work of those who came before us and of those who worked so hard to achieve gender equality. From Mary Ann McCracken and Winifred Carney to Rosa Parks and Angela Davis and women across the world united in that struggle. And our own assembly here reflects the change that we see across wider society. Obviously in Sinn Féin we have more female representatives than we've ever had before. We're led by two brilliant women in Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou Macdonald and a majority of our MLA team are women. And that is the same across society. We see women taking top jobs across all sectors across the North and that brings a perspective to the table that previously wasn't there. 
and all of that is to be welcomed. But we still have problems. There is still work to be done. We still have a pay gap. We still see women held to a higher standard than men, and we still see misogyny and sexism normalised every day. Across the world, we have a presidential hopeful with multiple allegations of sexual misconduct held against him, and yet he has still deemed a worthy candidate for presidency. Women are supporting him. Here in the North, I'm delighted that we're going in a different direction. We're going in the right direction. And some of the very first commitments in this new mandate go to the very heart of what you would consider women's issues. The North has a uh, domestic violence endemic. It's the second most dangerous place in Europe to be a woman. And so I'm glad that all parties have committed as a priority to delivering and fully implementing the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy. And I know that is a particular priority for my own party. The childcare strategy that again we're all united in delivering, we know that that dispropor disproportionately impacts women. The crisis in domiciliary care and respite services, again it is the women in most homes who pick up the burden of that care. If we work together to prioritise gender equality, fixing these problems will come about naturally and therefore I welcome this motion to the House and urge you all to support Gormagat. Uh, thank you. And may I call on the Deputy First Minister? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I just wanted to um, speak, just to add just some short words to this um, debate today. Uh, International Women's Day is an opportunity to take some time to celebrate women, to mark the achievements of women, but also to call out the continued harms and challenges many women face. I am deeply proud of being a woman, and as I said last week, I am proud of being a strong woman, I am proud of being a feisty woman, I am proud of being a fierce woman at times, um, but of course we know that all women come in many shapes and sizes, many different views and perspectives. Um, I also hope that as a woman I am also a kind woman and a compassionate woman, and I think that we all know so many different people, we don't all of course have to be the same. And it's one of the issues that I have highlighted over the course of last week as we celebrated, um, I know it's called International Women's Day, but it really felt like International Women's Week last week. I think that's a great thing, and hopefully that will continue to grow, perhaps even into International Women's uh, Month as we continue to have events. Um, because it is a great opportunity to highlight so many different aspects. It was fantastic to see so many of our community organisations um, and groups and communities have all of these fantastic events. You know, I come from a very long line of strong women who have shaped families, our communities, uh, the politics and, and the very fabric of this place we call home. And I often say that sometimes um, conservative women or women of faith um, may not always feel the most welcome with some of the women's movements. And sometimes we may feel that we are the wrong type of women. Um, for some of the movements. And I have always stepped forward and said there should never be a wrong type of woman. Women I know that are also conservative or of deep, conservative or of deep faith. Women of all different types of faith or perhaps none at all. All women should be welcome as part and partial of this campaign as we drive forward for a greater understanding and recognition of the incredible work that women do. When I look back to my own uh, history, you know, the um, unionist, uh, the Ulster Women's Unionist uh, Movement was the biggest um, movement of women um, on the island of Ireland of its time, but actually one of the biggest movements across the world. Uh, by 1913, the, um, Ulster, the, the, the Ulster Women's Unionist Council had an estimated membership of around um, 115,000 up to 200,000 women. Now, these were women who led the way on a pre-partition island of Ireland uh, north and south, uh, pushing for votes for women. These were women who were very often well connected, who used their position and their education and their opportunity to push for uh, votes for women. And it was the Unionist, uh, the Ulster Women's Unionist Council that really secured significant wins um, in Ireland, north and south, for uh, votes for women. And of course, they didn't just stop there. The Unionist women of that movement, the biggest female political movement, um, across these aisles went on in terms of the Ulster Covenant. And again, a lot of people don't realise that, but of course the men um, signed the Ulster Covenant and women had their own Ulster Covenant declaration. And an incredible 234,046 women came out to sign that declaration right across this island. 
And again, that was an incredible role that these women played, shaping the politics of today, stepping forward at a time where many women were probably told to sit back and be quiet. And again, you know, I'm incredibly proud of that history and heritage. That is something I want more of our young people to understand and realise about this place. That I will indeed. Um, uh, thank you, Member, for giving me. I'm sorry for, for interjecting such a, a, a good speech. I met the, the Deputy First Minister on Saturday at a breakfast, and I had two of my young children with me. Would you agree with me that one of the ways of um, breaking the barriers and, and killing the stereotypes is with our young people? And, and the introduction I made, which was you're one part of the two most powerful women in this country at this moment, to the, the two kids. Thank you. And the member has an extra minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Look, absolutely. I think one of the things that we have to do in this place, and it's so fantastic to see so many women elected um, across all different political parties, is because while I am incredibly proud of the heritage and history that I have, and the incredibly strong women who played that role in shaping Northern Ireland, in standing up for their politics and stepping forward, it's also that message that we can be absolutely proud of who we are. I am not just proud of being a unionist, I'm proud of being a woman, but of course that means of course that we should have the confidence to embrace um, the stories and the heritage and traditions of others. And I love to hear the stories, some of which we've already touched on. I've no doubt we will hear many more about the history and heritage that we have, but of course this is about moving forward. I just want to recognise in closing that I want to champion all of our mummies, our grannies, our sisters, our friends, the people who are there for other women doing incredible work. They are the bedrock, absolute bedrock of our schools, of our community groups, of our families, of our churches. And today, absolutely, this week has been a recognition of that. And I pay tribute. And as we move forward together, I hope we give that confidence to the new generation. We see plenty of little female politicians coming up through the ranks in all parties. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I call on Kelly Armstrong. Deputy Speaker, um, International Women's Day is a global celebration of the remarkable achievements of women across the world and I would like to thank the Speaker for an inspiring event on Thursday evening when we heard from civic female leaders about the roles that they have in the judiciary, in universities, in the arts, in sports. Um, it was a very inspiring event. But it does serve also International Women's Day as a poignant reminder of the progress we've made towards gender equality but it also sheds light on the significant work that remains ahead of us. The people elected us to this assembly and it's our duty to advocate for policies and initiatives that break down barriers, challenge stereotypes and foster environments where all women are valued and respected. Emma Sheer and MLA has already highlighted the debates that we've already had in this assembly since it finally started up again um, and it has been wonderful to see women's health being discussed, violence against women and girls has been brought up and childcare has been talked about. In our Alliance Manifesto, we outlined concrete commitments to address the systemic challenges facing women in Northern Ireland and one crucial aspect is that childcare piece that others have brought up already. Accessible and affordable childcare is not just a woman's issue, it's an economic imperative and a fundamental pillar of gender equality. The importance of investing in high quality childcare services ensures that every child has access to the care and education they deserve while empowering women to fully participate in the workforce. But let's not forget carers. 60% of carers are older women, like myself. I'm a carer. I believe that all carers should be respected. Well, sir, there's a lot of noise here in the back of what's going on here, and I can hardly hear you, and that's disrespectful to you, so I'm just going to get that sorted out before I ask you to speak again. But I will not take any extra time off, obviously. Have we got the door shut? Sorry. My apologies. Continue, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, as I was saying, let's not forget carers. 60% of carers are older women like myself. I believe that all carers should be respected and recognition given like there is for mothers and fathers, to provide help and support for them. In the <coughs> Carers Northern Ireland report, um, care or, or careers or care, it confirms that one in three women with unpaid caring responsibility have had to give up work. How is that equality? Furthermore, we cannot ignore the stark reality of poverty affecting women in Northern Ireland. Statistics due to be raised by the Northern Ireland Audit Office are expected to confirm a significant number of women are living in poverty, struggling to make ends meet and provide for their families. This is unacceptable in a society that prides itself on fairness and equality. We must take decisive action to address the root cause of poverty, including inadequate wages, lack of affordable housing and limited access to essential services. I have to ask, Deputy Speaker, why the anti-poverty strategy is not being prioritised. 
The draft is sitting waiting for publication. Adopting an anti-poverty strategy as an underpin of the next programme for government would help to lift so many women out of poverty. International Women's Day serves as a call to action for all of us to redouble our efforts in advancing gender equality and empowering women from all walks of life by supporting initiatives like childcare and addressing the pressing issue of poverty affecting women in our communities, we can create a more, and a more just and inclusive society for future generations. And I say to all to remember that in this House, not all women are treated equally. Because of the way that our system is built up, some of us, like myself, my vote is not counted in the same way. If we are to be true to the spirit of International Women's Day, then let's bring forward reform so that everyone is treated equally in this House. Let us seize this opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to building a world where every woman is valued, respected and giving, given the opportunity to thrive. Together, let us break down the barriers, challenge stereotypes and pave the way for a brighter, more equitable future for all. Thank you. I thank the member, and again, I apologise for the disturbance behind the chair. It was disrespectful, and we'll make sure it's not happened again. I call on Robbie Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I need to put an apology on the record. First of all, I gatecrashed the, the Women's Caucus last week, and they treated me very, very kindly. I was, I was midway through a handful of sandwiches, and I thought I was in an APG, but I was treated very kindly, but told to please leave the room, uh, which I did. So thank you. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's my pleasure to speak today uh, on this motion uh, which recognises International Women's Day 24 and to give the full support of myself and the Ulster Unionist Party. International Women's Day is a global celebration of the social, economic, cultural and political achievement of women. And whilst I know that here in Northern Ireland, right across the United Kingdom and indeed here on the island of Ireland, much has been achieved in that battle to see gender equality and fair treatment, there is still much more to be done and there's more that we should do. The motion before us today recognises the fact that the journey is still not complete. It identifies three areas for priority. These are breaking down barriers, challenging stereotypes and creating environments where all, all women are valued and respected. So in fully recognising the journey and steps that still need to be taken to, assure, uh, to ensure our young women in particular face no barrier to accessing their full life's potential, it would be remiss not to recognise the path that has been forged and the considerable walls that have already been demolished. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have had the privilege to work with many amazing women in many guises over the years. From those women who put on the uniforms of the Northern Ireland Prison Service and faced the same risks as I did, to those women who put on their fire kits in the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service and would have risked their lives to save others in the manner that I did. And I just want to read, I'll probably get into trouble for this, but three names onto the record. Uh, governor Amanda Allenby, who was fin fantastic and the best governor that I worked under. And then two firefighters, uh, uh, Kirsty Niblock, I was thinking of, she got married recently to Thomas Niblock, but Kirsty Niblock uh, and um, uh, Linda McCain in Portadown, two of the best firefighters that I ever uh, had the pleasure of working with. Um, and in this chamber, I've had the pleasure over eight years of also working with some absolutely fantastic uh, women. And in those eight years, the executive office has had at least one woman leading this place, and more often two, and that is to be celebrated. And it is good to note that we have 38% of our members are, are now women, but that's not enough. That should be seen as a floor and not a ceiling. However, I think it would be remiss not to take this opportunity to remind ourselves of uh, a trailblazer and a pioneer who was fearless uh, in her day, and I would go as far as to say a revolutionary. Uh, the title goes From Linen to the Lords, and it's a descriptor uh, that some have given to the late Baroness uh, Mayblood. Baroness Blood was a woman who led an extraordinary life and is a leading example for all girls and young girls and women across Northern Ireland. She is the first female peer from Northern Ireland, and she used her title to help those from disadvantaged communities. It was a, a title that I don't think that she saw. Baroness Blood left school at 14 years of age and began working in her local, local linen mill. Then she joined the Transport and General Workers' Union, which I think was fundamental uh, in, in, in fashioning uh, her trajectory. Therefore, from a young age, Baroness Blood epitomised the struggle and fight as an advocate for women's and workers' rights and had a proven commitment to improving lives which set her on her remarkable path. In 1996, Baroness Blood helped set up the, women's, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, giving women a voice in politics, which played a pivotal role in the peace talks leading to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. 
1989, Blood became a community worker on a project for long-term long unemployed men. She also worked with the Greater Shankill Early Years Project as an information officer from 1994 to 1998. Here she helped to establish three community centres in the Greater Shankill area. And as chair of the Early Years in Belfast from 2000 to 2009, she contributed to the well-being of many, many families and children. Similar to myself, Baroness Blood was passionate about early years intervention for children and she knew the importance about giving children the best possible start to life. Baroness Blood made significant contributions to the political landscape here in Northern Ireland and her tireless efforts in community work and political activism laid the groundwork for initiatives like Sure Start. Baroness Blood was not simply a forerunner for workers and young people. She was a woman's activist who challenged the status quo and male-dominated environments, and she managed to inspire future generations to show up and speak up. I support the motion, Mr. Speaker, and in Baroness Blood's own words, and by way of encouragement to all women in Northern Ireland, I suggest a, a line worth learning. Watch my lips. I'm speaking. Uh, thank you. And I call on Sinead Ennis. Gurr uh, Last Clan Corla, and happy International Women's Day or Women's Week. Um, to everybody and hope everybody had a positive um, and enjoyable time over the weekend celebrating not, a, not only our achievements but also advocating for greater equality um, and I want to use my time today to highlight the inequalities that still exist for women in sport um, but I also want to acknowledge and pay tribute to the organisations uh, here in Ireland and across the globe working to end those inequalities. I grew up playing competitive soccer and football at a time when there was little or no infrastructure or facilities for women and girls to encourage us into the sports that we loved. That is why I am forever thankful to my parents who encouraged and supported my talents. While thankfully things have moved on and improved since I was a kid, we need to make sure that girls being encouraged into sport becomes not a matter of luck but a reality for all girls. In recent years, we have seen the positive impact of national campaigns like the 2020 National Initiative for Women in Sport, which seeks to highlight the impact of seeing and being role models and the essential part they play in encouraging women and girls into sport. We know that representation matters. It matters in sport, it matters in politics, and it matters in all aspects of public life. And I'm a firm believer in the adage, if she can't see it, she can't be it. I think I was probably in my late teens or early 20s before I clearly remember seeing competitive women's sport on TV. And even now, no matter what it is, no matter what team's playing, even though I'm an ardent Man United fan, um, if, I see, if I see women's sport on the TV, I'm transfixed. I have to watch it because it just wasn't, wasn't the norm. The importance of visibility cannot be overstated when it comes to the future of sport in Ireland and across the globe. If women and girls don't see themselves reflected in the sport, they may not realise their potential and recognise their talent, which is part of the reason there's a high rate of, of girls dropping out from sport in their early teens. We need to address why this is the case. There is a fundament, fundamental lack of understanding about women's bodies, the effect menstruation, for example, has on athletic performance. The confidence something as simple as having the right kit can give a young girl cannot be overstated. I wish I had more time to go into my own personal experience and give some more examples about historically um, the sports that I've played um, and how, how the teams I've played for, how we were treated as somehow less important uh, than our male counterparts. Uh, from hand-me-down kits, no access to proper training pitches, having the added burden of fundraising for basic essentials such as jerseys, the transport to games, and the list goes on and on. But I think the biggest indignity... I will, go ahead. So the member is already um, is aware too, but would you agree as well that uh, in terms of some local government areas that the, the decision to actually remove pitches for the women's sports in order to facilitate the men's is a policy that should absolutely be done away with um, because we are and we do have knowledge that this is taking place um, with, with, through local government but also private um, sporting um, arenas too. And the member has an extra minute. Not entirely over the, the specific area you're talking about. Um, I think there is, it is incumbent, especially when government contracts or government money has been used to build facilities, that that is built into the contract, that it's, it's not the uh, preserve of, of, of males, of men, that it should be uh, for everybody. Um, so, yeah, as I said, probably one of the biggest um, indignities was being denied access to our prestigious county grounds for championship or national league games. And, and while I'm glad to see that more and more women's matches are being held in our county grounds, it wasn't that long ago that we had to rely on the generosity of individual club, clubs to provide their facilities so that we could fulfil championship 
fixtures. That is both embarrassing and unacceptable. And I fully support efforts being made to amalgamate both the men's and women's codes within the GEA, and I hope that we will finally see fair distribution of finances and resources. Equally, I'm delighted that women's soccer teams, both north and south, are finally and rightfully playing their games in both the Aviva and Windsor Park, and hopefully not too soon Casement Park. That should be the norm and not the exception. We need to take every, op uh, every avenue open to all of us to promote the importance of representation for women in sport in all areas where decisions um, are being made as well. And why we are using this uh, International Women's Day, this occasion, to speak about the issues that matter to us um, as women. We need to make every day about recognising integrity, authenticity and excellence in whatever form it takes. And maybe we could start by changing our language around how we speak about women in sport. For example, why does it matter what women were? Um, maybe we could question why women gymnasts wear skimpy leotards where men wear trousers. And maybe we could all make an effort to attend at least one female-specific sport every month. Maybe we could read more female journalists. Maybe we could ask our clubs, no matter what sports we're involved in, how many training sessions, how much equipment and support and access do the women get in comparison to their men, uh, their male counterparts. And maybe it's time for all of us to recognise our own sheroes, because after all, if you can't see it, you can't really be it. Gura Maigat. Uh, thank you, and I call on Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise to wholeheartedly support um, this motion before the House um, today, and I'm speaking as a DUP woman, as a unionist woman, an MLA for South Antrim since 2011, as you'll be aware, Mr Deputy Speaker, and still the only female MLA elected to this House in the constituency of South Antrim. At 39 years old, I became the youngest and the only ever female to serve as Mayor of Antrim in 2010-2011. And these facts clearly tell us that um, you know, there's much more work to be done in terms of ensuring that women are properly represented in political life here in Northern Ireland. It is vitally important that we do take part in this global celebration of the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. And Mr Deputy Speaker, sadly, there is still much misogyny around and even on International Women's Day posts, we will all have seen too many examples of how some still simply cannot cope with the very idea that women are out of the kitchen and in the workplace, let alone um, in government. We do need to support each other, and we do need to, support, we need, need to push ourselves forward. We do need to ensure that our voices are heard, and they're heard loud and clear. I'm glad that this Assembly has committed to really urgent priorities, such as dealing with pay parity and pay gaps within our public services, such as affordable childcare, such as the need for a women's health care strategy, and such as the all-important issue of dealing with uh, violence against women and girls. Would the member give way? I will indeed. Thank you, Madam, for giving way. Um, we all sit here in relative comfort, um, and some of us will feel that more than others, but... Um, there are many women across the world, and you speak of women who suffer violence, and there are many women across the world who suffer violence for their faith. Last week in uh, northern Nigeria, 200 women were kidnapped by Boko Haram terrorists. Those women will suffer violence, rape, forced marriage. Would the member agree with me that we also need to look outside of Northern Ireland and look at the issues? that face women in many countries today where they are persecuted for their faith. And the member has an extra minute. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the member for a very valu valuable contribution. And of course, this is a global movement, um, International Women's Day, week, possibly month, maybe we'll just take the whole year in the future. Um, uh, so I think it's vitally important that the, the member's points are, are taken aboard. Absolutely, it's a global movement and we, and we want to see um, you know, we can complain about issues here in Northern Ireland and they, they, they seem quite pathetic when, when you hear of the sufferings that are happening across the world. So we absolutely have to support all of those women across the world in, in, in their plight. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to give my mother a shout out for setting the example to me of what a hardworking, strong, fierce, caring mother should be. And my three sisters for their unwavering support that we all have for each other and for my daughters, and I include my daughters-in-law, all of whom make me proud each and every day. So I want to say to all of them, happy International Women's Day week. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I call on Connie Egan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm glad um, to speak on this motion today, and I really welcome that it's been signed from members from across parties. I spent last Friday, International Women's Day, at an event organised by a local organisation, Kulkuli Women's Centre, in my constituency. The atmosphere and the spirit of the event captured everything that International Women's Day should be about. Local organisations and women from all backgrounds came together, not just to celebrate how far we have come, but to discuss what more we need to do and the challenges facing women today. We heard from a senior PSNI officer who had overcome a historically male-dominated working environment, juggled the demands of training with a young family and prevailed over gender stereotypes to excel in her career. She now uses her role to help women and children who have been victims of sexual assault and rape. I was heartened to hear how legislation surrounding coercive control stalking and cyber flashing introduced by Justice Minister Naomi Long last mandate were being effectively used by the PSNI to apprehend offenders. We also heard from a woman who ran a successful local family business but had also overcome adversity of a course of control and now used her experience to help others in our local community. We are so lucky in Northern Ireland to have a strong community and voluntary sector who do the legwork when it comes to supporting and uplifting women in our society. Whether it's an affordable social enterprise model of childcare, providing therapeutic support to those who've been subject to domestic abuse, or through education and employment courses, we owe them the recognition they deserve for their transformative work in communities. There can be no doubt we have made progress over the last century. Women now have more legislative protections than ever before, we have the most representative assembly in our history and we enjoy freedoms that those in previous generations had to fight for. But there is so much more to do. <coughs> Absolutely, I'll give way. I thank the member for giving way. Would she agree that we're so lucky that we have uh, now more than ever more female representatives and to ensure that we keep that momentum and increase that number, that issues like public safety of members and the lack of uh, an efficient maternity leave uh, for members um, across this house play a role, a negative role, in putting people, women getting off getting into politics? Would you agree? And uh, the member has an extra minute. Absolutely. Thank you. And I thank you for your intervention. Um, advice that was given to me um, what, before I became an MLA was that you cannot be what you cannot see. And if we really want to have a representative society, whether that's in local government, in this chamber or um, in parliament, we need to make sure that this place is accessible for women. And that includes security provisions and also um, maternity provisions. I know there are women in this chamber today who did not avail of those and it's been a massive challenge for them. So I thank you for your intervention. As I was saying, there is a lot more work to do. One illustration of this um, was research that was published by the Royal College of Psychiatrists on International Women's Day. This research showed that the leading cause of mental ill health in women in the UK is violence and abuse, closely followed by relationship issues such as coercive control. I hope with more women than ever before elected to this assembly, we can come together and use the rest of this mandate to make progress. We have many outstanding issues. The strategic framework to end violence against women and girls has still not been published. We're the only part of these islands to not have a strategy to end gender-based violence. Last month, we passed a motion supporting a women's health strategy, something desperately needed for women in our society who are facing health inequalities, such as delays in their cervical screening tests, inadequate diagnosis and care for endometriosis, and treatment pathways for menopause. This is certainly not an exhaustive list of women's health issues that need action by this assembly and executive urgently. One of the biggest barriers to women accessing employment opportunities is accessible and affordable childcare. I was heartened to hear recent commitments from executive ministers on this issue, but for many families, they need intervention and support now. I also want to speak about the women in our society who have faced unimaginable abuse. Those who are victims and survivors of the mother and baby institutions and Magdalene laundries. These women in Northern Ireland have been left behind. While the Republic of Ireland have made some progress in addressing this shameful part of our past, we still have not introduced a redress scheme for those subject to the trauma of these institutions or installed a memorial for the victims and survivors. I sincerely hope that we can come together and deliver for these women as a matter of urgency to recognise and address the horrors that were inflicted upon them.
Mr Deputy Speaker, I could talk about so much more, but I am constrained by time. I hope that the women in this chamber work together with common goals to address historical injustices faced by women, the current challenges in our society, but also to celebrate and uplift each other and how far we have come. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Declan Kearney. The International Women's Day was marked at Belfast City Hall with the <laughs> unveiling of monuments to both Mary Ann McCracken and Winifred Kearney, and two iconic Belfast women whose lives were dedicated completely to the opposing of uh, slavery, exploitation, injustice and oppression. And both were champions of gender equality and anti-sectarianism and also social and national emancipation. The struggle for women's rights is hundreds of years old, and many, many brave women through the ages have challenged patriarchy, class, and inequality. Those achievements and that sacrifice deserves to be celebrated in appropriate and significant ways. But International Women's Day also points us towards what more needs to be done, because in today's world, women continue to be denied economic, social and national freedoms. And nowhere, Elias Kionkorya, is that more stark than in Palestine and particularly Gaza. This year, there will have been no celebration of International Women's Day or Mother's Day, particularly on the Gaza Strip. By the 8th of March, last Friday, Israel's war will have killed 9,000 Palestinian women, with over 54,000 injured. 5,200 Palestinian women have lost their babies. 50,000 Palestinian women who are pregnant cannot give birth in a safe place because there are no hospitals, medical centres or safe places to give birth. 65,000 breastfeeding Palestinian mothers cannot feed properly or look after their children safely. And in the north of Gaza, 350,000 women and girls are starving. Half a million Palestinian women are currently homeless. The women of Palestine need to hear, see, and feel our solidarity. Concretenu ayanu a yas concorla, Janama ahrish anish, erin waknu sho a tachomniha, er vishna mra na palestina. Kushlat naman, evenus naman. Kinnotus krahiat agasauliat naman. Birsha, fulunch, strahlch naman. Jing Walcha, Agus Chomotus, Edra Kyarta Naman, Makala Naman, Reur Devra Gan Eder Yalu, Na Kosser Bolog, Dohas as Fish Naman Lenarlan, Akni Sirsha Mra Na Krenye, Go Sirsha Mra Na Palestina, Goromaigov. I call on Mike Nesbitt. Yeah, speaker, thank you. Very uh, happy to say a few words uh, on the motion. And I begin by thanking the Deputy First Minister for mentioning the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, uh, who produced some fine parliamentarians, not least uh, Dame Deira Parker, who became the longest serving female in uh, the Northern Ireland Parliament, and like Robin Swan, spent time as Minister uh, for Health. Just at the end of last week, as the International Day was coming up, I got quite nostalgic thinking about my first job and my first boss. Uh, the job was a, a sports reporter with uh, BBC Northern Ireland, and the boss was the formidable Joy Williams. Uh, and you know, if you think about a woman becoming head of a sports department in the 70s, it always seemed really quite uh, a remarkable feat. But given what we now know about some of the attitudes and behaviours uh, in the BBC at the time, you know, when you think about people like uh, Stuart Hall, uh, Jimmy Savile, Rolf Harris, 
uh, I think her achievement was just all the more remarkable uh, as a woman to reach that position in such a kind of testosterone-filled uh, environment. And she liked nothing more than encouraging and mentoring young talent. You think of uh, George Hamilton, who had a stellar career with the BBC in London and then RTE in Dublin. Uh, think of Alan Green, for a long time, one of BBC Radio's top two football commentators. Uh, Mark Robson, um, who no doubt commentated on the semi-tragic events at Twickenham over the weekend. Uh, and, and Jim Neely, uh, who's been going on forever. And there, you, you, members will have noted, four men. And once again, it was a woman, uh, an, an outlier, uh, who, who brought them on. Uh, what I'd like to do, Mr. Speaker, is just talk about a concept that I think uh, will eventually come uh, to how we do government uh, in this place. And the concept is gender budgeting, uh, which is a way to promote equality uh, through fiscal policy uh, by anal analyzing uh, and disaggregating data so that we understand the impact of, what, of our spend uh, separately on men and women and that we can take, therefore, corrective action uh, against it. Um, there will be an update on this uh, on the 21st of the month with the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group. Uh, but just to illustrate, I have some figures which are maybe four or five years old. So, for example, if the UK government invested 2% of gross domestic product in construction, uh, they would create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. 180,000 of those jobs would be for women, but men would get 560,000 new jobs. If, on the other hand, you put that 2% of GDP into care, either social or child care, Men would get 48,000 new jobs. The number of new jobs for women would be 1,070,000. That's a swing of nearly 900,000, depending on where you're making your investment. So I would hope to bring a debate uh, to this chamber within the course of this mandate to start the process of gender budgeting. And by, by start, I mean, let's start disaggregating the data. So, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, the All Party Group on Sport took an interest in gender budgeting after a horrendous occasion when the Connaught Senior Women's Rugby Team had to get changed for, for an interprovincial match in a car park surrounded by rubbish and rats because there weren't any changing facilities for them. So we started asking governing bodies about disaggregating their spend, and they weren't able to tell us. They were able to say we have spent money specifically promoting uh, our code, our uh, Gaelic Football Association Football, Rugby Union Football, in schools for women. But in terms of where the money goes into clubs, what percentage goes to the men's game, what percentage goes to, what percentage goes to the women's game, they were not able to tell us. So the first step has to be to encourage government departments to start disaggregating the spend so that we understand the impact we are having differentially on men and on women. As I say, I, I hope to get the support of the House before the end of this mandate to start that process. Uh, thank you. And I call on Linda Dillon. And I appreciate the opportunity to rise to support this motion today. And this motion is celebrating social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. But what we must remember is that much of what we celebrate was very hard won and hard fought for. And on many occasions, it was fought for and won by victims and survivors, both here in the North, across this island and right across the world. Victims, many of whom were victims of state and church. Women and girls have suffered unimaginable abuse, abuses and repression, often at the hand, as I say, of state and church across this island and across the world. These are not abuses that were suffered in our historical past. These women and girls are here today. They are still fighting for justice. They went through mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries, and they're still waiting on legislation to implement the recommendations of the Truth Recovery Design Panel. And there can be no further delay. This must be implemented with urgency. 
These women and girls have laid bare the most horrendous abuses that they suffered. It is these women speaking up that has started a conversation that will ensure that all of the stigma and shame of what happened belongs to those who inflicted it, not those who suffered it. They were mothers. Yesterday we celebrated Mother's Day. Those mothers didn't get to celebrate with their children because their children were ripped from them. Those children didn't get to say Happy Mother's Day because they never knew that mother on many occasions, never met them, and those that were lucky enough to meet them very often were so traumatised that they were never able to build a relationship. These are the women and girls that we must remember on International Women's Day. And I want to put on the record our acknowledgement and thanks to them. We want to see the progression of the legislation. We must all support the women and girls around us and speak up when something is not right. Because people knew what was going on and they did not speak up. They did not support those women and girls. The silence of all those who do not speak up for women and girls suffering abuse, whether it is in their home, their place of education, their workplace, or anywhere else for that matter. They offer protection for and compliance with the abuser. We keep saying no more. Well, no more means no more silence. Support women, speak up, and report abuse. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge also the women across the world that are suffering as a result of conflict, and has, as has already been referred to, particularly those women in Palestine. And for all of those children, again, who yesterday did not have their mummy to say Happy Mother's Day, and for all of those mothers that were not able to hug their children and enjoy being a mother, we think of them today. There is a movement out there that says now, nothing about us without us. That means all women. All women need to be involved in conversations about what this place will look like and what every society right across our world will look like. We need to ensure that women are heard here and everywhere else. That is our responsibility. It is not only our responsibility to make sure that we have a good life and our daughters and sisters have a good life. It is our responsibility to ensure that every woman has a decent standard of life, that every woman has equality, that every woman has hope, that every woman has a chance of just having a good life, not suffering abuse, not suffering at the hands of oppressive regimes, and not suffering at the hands of genocidal governments. Thank you, and I call on Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to take part in this cross-party motion to recognise International Women's Day. While a global celebration of the remarkable achievements of women throughout history and acknowledgement of the persistent challenges that women continue to face, International Women's Day is an opportunity to voice day-to-day -day issues that prevent advancement of gender balance in my constituency and across Northern Ireland. Despite the progress we have achieved, women still confront systemic barriers that obstruct their full participation in society. Gender-based violence, unequal access to health care and education, and limited economic opportunities because appropriate infrastructure simply does not exist. Inspire Inclusion, this year's theme, directs us to invest in women to drive forward progress. Progress is something that we must do for gender equality, but also across all aspects of society. When we invest in women, everyone benefits. Individuals, families, communities, our public services. Imagine if we truly invested in childcare, as well as creating opportunities for women to participate fully in the workforce, we yield a wide range of benefits for wider society, including, including promoting early childhood development, stimulating economic growth, furthering social equity and inclusion, supporting community well-being and advancing gender equality. Childcare is a vital social and economic investment that will create a more prosperous and equitable society for all. And I appreciate the commitment of the executive to devise and fund a childcare strategy but it is not happening quick enough, and I would encourage the executive to implement interim measures to support women and their families until a full strategy can be realised. Investment in women's health is also key to progress. Often we forget that our role as MLAs is to improve public services for everyone in Northern Ireland, and half of that everyone are women, 
Yet our services, in particular health and social care services, are not serving them. We need to improve in areas such as mental health, reproductive health, family plan planning, menopause, understanding conditions such as autism and ADHD, which present diff differently in women and girls, but research has typically focused on men and boys, therefore symptoms are not necessarily picked up. And I expect there are many more examples where inequality in research has meant that women are treated less. Specifically, we need services which recognise and support the significant changes that pregnancy does to our bodies and minds. I became a mother last year, and I am so blessed with my beautiful Indy, but she did not come with a manual, at least she left it in there. A lot of experiences are unexpected, societal expectations for mothers are high, and every day is a palpable worry. Yes, this is life, babies are born every day, and many women have come before me and many more will come after. But surely that's why we should support mothers, because of their immeasurable impact on all of us. And happy Mother's Day to all the, the women who love and care for us. But maybe our gratitude should start with public services that they have long needed. Finally, investing in women requires us to address the root causes of gender inequality, including harmful stereotypes and discriminatory practices. It involves challenging societal norms that limit women's potential and perpetuate gender-based violence. It is a powerful statement that our executive, who is led by two very capable women, has prioritised a strategy which aims to change attitudes, value women and girls, and stop abuse and violence. And it's not every man, and indeed men who abhor this behaviour as much as I do, are so important in speaking out and supporting this strategy. And I appreciate the male members of this House who have uh, taken the lead to support this work. They must be role models for boys and younger men. And there are great examples of this already, including the White Ribbon Campaign, where local football teams, including Korean Football Club, have worn a right, uh, white ribbon to send a positive message. Investing in women is not only a moral imperative, but also an economic one. When we invest in the education, health and social and economic empowerment of women, we unlock significant potential to contribute meaningfully to our communities and wider society. Studies consistently show that societies with greater gender equality tend to have higher levels of prosperity and competitiveness. And I want that for my constituency in Northern Ireland. I support this motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you. And can I call on Deborah Erskine to uh, wind? And Deborah, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, on Friday, obviously, we celebrated International Women's Day, and yesterday we celebrated Mother's Day. This morning, I woke up with Spice Girls on the radio, so it just shows uh, what I listen to in the morning, but it certainly was apt, given this motion um, the, today in the chamber. And it takes me back um, to that 90s movement of girl power. Um, and uh, it might seem a bit frivolous talking about that, but there is something in that, actually, um, in realising your true potential as a girl and as a woman and the positive force for nature uh, that that can be. Uh, it's important that we make sure that we have aspiring uh, role models uh, within our society for young girls and women. And that's on all of us in this chamber as well, both male and female, to ensure that. For me, I want to ensure that there is true genuine equality. I just don't want to be a tick box because I'm a woman. I want my own merits to shine through. And I think that that's important to recognise that. It was very positive last week to see the photograph of all the female um, MLAs from the chamber. In 1998, just 14% of MLAs were women. Today, 38%. And today, we have the first all-female uh, executive office, and that's a very powerful statement to have. I couldn't stand in this chamber today without uh, recognising two women that were very influential in my own life and shaped uh, my life, um, both in the home and politically. Uh, my Granny Armstrong, who uh, taught me the value of fighting for my place in the world and never given up in the face of barriers that may exist. And the first female uh, First Minister for Northern Ireland, Arlene Foster, who recognised something in me that I didn't 
um, and without her encouragement, I wouldn't be here today. Women looking out for women. And I hope that continues to grow, not only, uh, t not only in this chamber, it's important that we foster a legacy of mutual understanding and a willingness to work together. And I hope that that will feed out of this chamber into the rest of society and that we deal with issues such as childcare, which are an important issue outside of this chamber and inside it as well. Um, and we need to deal with that, and I hope we can um, for all of our families in society. So I just want to move to some of the contributions that were in the chamber today. Um, I thank Cara Hunter, who moved the motion today, and uh, she pointed to the barriers that have been broken down and the need to uh, do more in society. She re uh, also recognised period poverty, which is a huge issue that uh, still needs tackled in society. Um, and she pointed to the open discussions now that we have around women's health, which are brilliant to see, um, and particularly on topics that were once taboo. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. Emma Sheeran, um, she pointed to the theme of International Women's Day, which is to inspire inclusion, um, and pointed as well to the change that there is in society, but there's still more work to be done, and of course the strategies that are coming forward to support and help women. The Deputy First Minister, um, she pointed out, you know, the fact that we're celebrating and marking uh, International Women's Day in so many different ways. It's okay to be feisty and to be strong as a woman and put forward your point. I'm probably in that category as well. Um, and uh, she also made a very valid point in relation to women of faith um, who sometimes feel that they're on the margins of some of the uh, women's movements. And also the Unionist Women's Council, um, which some of my family members were actually part of as well, which also helped shape uh, my political life. Kelly Armstrong highlighted the issues around carers and uh, childcare and poverty and the need to tackle stereotypes. And I welcome uh, Mr Butler's uh, contribution as well. And we welcome and we should actually recognise that whilst it's important that we as women tap ourselves on the back, we also need to stand up and say thank you to the men that also encourage inclusion and support women as well. Um, yes, of course. Member given way, um, but the member agrees with me. It's actually really important that, that men, in terms of creating that role model, particularly for young boys, is instrumental in breaking through the ceiling and challenging those stereotypes that many of us indeed grew up with. And I thank the member for his intervention because he's absolutely right because that helps in terms of education when it comes to tackling issues around violence against women and girls. Um, and I also want to thank him for pointing out uh, the contribution that Baroness May Blood uh, made to life in Northern Ireland and also some of his colleagues that he raised as well in the chamber, so thank you. Uh, Sinead Ennis, she raised about, uh, she really highlighted sport and I want to thank her for, for bringing that into uh, the debate today because uh, we've all been there. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed sports as a teenage girl, but after that, it didn't really go anywhere, as you can see by the look of me. I don't go running as much as often. But, I mean, you, you laid down the mantle in terms of, uh, for us, turning up and supporting women's teams. And uh, I think that's an important challenge for, for all of us to take on. Uh, the junior minister, uh, uh, Ms Cameron, she pointed out how she was the first uh, female mayor in her council area. And she, uh, off, she also raised how some people still believe that women's place is in the kitchen. And unfortunately, I've also had those comments made to me um, whenever I became an MLA, asking how my husband copes without me. Uh, my husband copes very, very well. Um, so uh, I want to move to Diane Dodd's intervention, uh, which was a very poignant and valid point to make. Whilst we're talking about the issues that we face here in Northern Ireland, there is a wide world out there. And we have to recognise that we also have to work on ensuring that women and girls elsewhere have the same 
rights and opportunities that we do. So I thank you for that. And Connie Egan, she referenced about events in her own constituency, and I thank you for pointing out to the challenges that some women in her own constituency have overcome um, in relation to her own area. Uh, Declan Kearney, I just, uh, he referenced about uh, Gaza and the Israel situation, and I hope he will join with me in condemning Hamas and the torture and rape of women that Hamas carried out uh, as well. Mike Nesbitt, he highlighted uh, the TV industry and how difficult it was for women in that industry, and, and actually still is, um, even in terms of sport. Uh, you know, whenever women are commentating on sport as well, and the commentary that can be on social media. He also raised an important point about gender budgeting, which I thought was interesting, um, and something that you know, we could look at um, in different departments. Ms. Dillon, she pointed out about uh, historical and institutional abuse, and I thank you for your very powerful contributions in relation to that. And I know she feels very strongly on this issue, and she's been a very powerful advocate in the chamber for quite some time on this issue. And the importance of speaking out uh, with our voice for other women is really, really important uh, whenever they don't have a voice. And lastly, Claire Tugden, um, the need for investment in women in all aspects of our civic, and, uh, civic society is a very important point. And just to say, I've seen a lovely photograph of her in Indy um, at the weekend, and uh, we do, as a chamber, want to put on record our thanks to the many women across our daily lives that have helped and supported us and you, uh, got us to this point. So I thank the members for their contributions today and for the motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The question is that the motion standing in the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contraries? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, members, members, I have received notification.